I am Ramona and welcome to Ramona Interviews. And with me in the chair today is a woman who's going to tell us about an initiative that is sweeping into Worcester. Uh, it has been here, so it's not brand, brand new. We hope that it stays for a very long time because it addresses, it addresses a, a need and it gives a reason and it helps to bring people together to battle and to go over those hurdles and challenges of leaving smoking behind. Welcome, Tina. Thank you, Ramona. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Could you introduce yourself and, and start to tell us about um, this, this program and how it comes down and especially about what has just passed, which was that uh, initiative fourth anniversary for the Smokers Hall of Fame. Thank you. Thank you again for letting me come in on to your show. I'm the project coordinator for uh, the Central Mass Tobacco-Free Community Partnership, which is a program of the State Department of Public Health. And we are, um, our mission is really to help all communities reduce smoking and um, reduce secondhand smoking rates. So we have many strategies for doing that. And one of them was the Ex-Smokers Hall of Fame that you were speaking of that we had as a pilot program at UMass. There's several other um, communities around the state um, who have done Ex-Smoker Hall of Fame in the, fame in the past. Um, in the north east area, the southeast area, and the western part of the state, there are coordinators similar to myself who coordinate those state grants in those areas. And they've all had Ex-Smoker Hall of Fame. And so the state has a website called Make Smoking History. And on that website, you can see other people who have quit smoking, who've made the commitment to quit, and who've been willing to come forward as champions um, to uh, help uh, provide motivation for smokers to quit. And that's really the reason for the program. And how is it set up? Um, now, this happened in the spring, and it was at UMass. UMass sponsored it. So how did it find itself at UMass? And then how many people did it touch and reach? And where would you like to see that program go? I mean, if someone would just hear the name, what is it that you want them to remember about this program? What is it celebrating and how does it celebrate that? Well, the UMass was a good place to start with because uh, the UMass campus went smoke free for a whole campus, including the hospitals, um, in 2008. So everywhere you go on the UMass Memorial campuses and the UMass Memorial hospitals um, and all the affiliate organizations that work with UMass, um, are all smoke-free buildings, smoke-free campuses. And uh, they pr provided some initiative for that as a anniversary. So we chose the date in, in um, April mm -hmm. that, that um, celebrated that. So um, as you know, most uh, places around the state are smoke-free in terms of um, looking at the uh, smoke-free workplace law that was passed by the state in 2005. So as you know, you can't smoke indoors in most and all workplaces in Massachusetts. Um, but there's a lot of schools and campuses that have really just begun to go smoke free on the campus itself, including the outdoor um, environment, which is really important because smokers tell us um, that A, they really want to quit. 80% of smokers want to quit. And having a smoke free environment helps them to quit and it provides an environment in which they can uh, get supported in their wish to, to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. And they have to go a lot further if they want to be of the whole campus. I That's mean, it's right. not everybody can crowd to the door and then you walk into a building and you have That's everybody right. smoking in the front. That's right. And breathe the air. They now actually have to go out much, much further. That's right. And the city of Worcester is one of the cities in the state that has recently begun to pass uh, regulations um, regarding buffer zones around all municipal buildings in Worcester that you have to be 50 feet away from the entrance of all public buildings, municipal buildings here in Worcester. So again, those kinds of um, initiatives and regulations are geared towards protecting the public from secondhand smoke, but also for motivating um, and supporting smokers to quit because research shows that that's true. <laughs> so when you had the initiative, who were the people that came uh, to the initiative and what did they see when they were there? And what was it celebrating? Was it celebrating just the people who joined this particular group, or was it, how did, how did it work? How did mm -hmm. it express itself? Mm -hmm. Well, the event itself was uh, twofold. One, to celebrate the anniversary of the Smoke Free Campus. So there were several um, uh, 
uh, leaders from the campus who came and spoke at the event. Um, and on the website, which you'll be giving out the URL and the information about on your um, TV cameras, mm -hmm. with your TV cameras, um, people can go to the website and see photos of the event and of the speakers and get information about the event that was held in the spring. So uh, it celebrated the Smoke Free uh, Campus anniversary, and it also uh, celebrated the champions that we interviewed. So we had 16 um, ex-smokers that we interviewed. We heard their stories. And then we created um, large uh, display boards that um, s made a synopsis of their story, mm -hmm. had a quote from them, and with their photograph on it. And um, all of those display boards were there at the event, including many of the ex-smokers themselves. And several of them spoke at the event. And um, it was a very moving event. And um, people were really uh, in excited to hear the ex-smokers themselves because we know from all the rates that um, research tells us that smoking in um, the, especially the Worcester area is higher than the state average. The smoking rate for Massachusetts is about 16 percent, which has come down a great deal in the past 10 years. But the rate for the city of Worcester is about 23 percent, so it's higher than the state rate. And there's several um, communities of people or populations of people where the smoking rates are higher. Mm -hmm. So um, the Latino community and minority communities, the African American community, have smoking rates higher than the state average. So we're really interested in um, uh, championing ex-smokers who represent those populations to help motivate people to quit. Yeah. That's right. How does, um, you know, uh, especially with the young kids you kind of hear, well, chewing tobacco is not that bad and Oh, those smokeless cigarettes. You know, well, they, they, they really don't have that much stuff in it. What, 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 do people go through those same kind of classes for those types of things? Are they just as addictive? Yes, they are. And I'm glad you brought that up because one of the um, results of having all these uh, restrictions on where people can smoke in, in, the, in the United States, which is so important, and the restriction on access for buying uh, tobacco products and where you can sell them, is that the tobacco industry has started... Uh, marketing all these new products, so I'm really glad you brought that up, those smokeless tobacco products and the chewing tobacco. Um, and especially for young people, they're marketing towards them, to, towards young people. Yep, they are. And um, the um, one thing w most um, people know is that chewing tobacco is really bad for you and can cause, um, you know, really serious um, cancers of the mouth and of the tongue. So, you know, the in the baseball um, Leagues have really um, spent a lot of time educating people about that too. So most baseball players now, when you see them, uh, you know, chew gum in the in the dugouts. But the tobacco industry knows this now, and instead of actually marketing chewing tobacco, what they're marketing is um, smokeless tobacco, um, which comes in either small tins or in um, packages that look like gum or dissolvable products that look like Tic Tacs or candy. And uh, we know how susceptible children are to that and to young, uh, young adults are to that because um, they have flavors and they're, you know, they are very much like um, uh, candy. And mm -hmm. for young people, it's a very easy transition going from candy and things that taste and, and, and look like candy and have flavors to other products that are the same way. So the dissolvable tobacco products have tobacco in them and they have higher rates of nicotine and carbon mon uh, monoxide in them. And, um, than a cigarette? Than a cigarette, that's right. Higher levels of tar and, um, and nicotine than cigarettes do. And they just coat it over with a flavoring. That's right, with a flavoring and put some sugar in it so it tastes like a candy. So um, it's really important that we educate uh, people around those, especially young people, and that um, people understand that um, even though something is not um, uh, combustible or doesn't have secondhand smoke involved with it. It still is a tobacco product. Now you mentioned the e-cigarettes, which are the you know the the uh, really popular with today's young generation, especially the population of people who have laptops and Blackberries and iPads, because it's a really uh, product that looks like a pen almost, mm -hmm. and it, it has no tobacco in it. It's just a cartridge on the inside with a battery. And when you pull the top off, the battery lights and charges up and heats up the, um, the, um, the um, container inside that has nicotine in it and a little bit of water vapor. 
so that the water vapor heats up the nicotine. And when you inhale, you're inhaling the water with the nicotine in it. And when you exhale, you're exhaling water vapor that looks like smoke. Okay. So you continue your nicotine habit, which is... So you get addicted to the nicotine. That's right. You're yeah. continuing the nicotine habit. Or if you start with that, you're going to develop a nicotine habit, which is going to... Um, make you, uh, which is going to allow you to continue to smoke in environments where you can smoke and then use these products where you can't smoke. So we really see them as a, as a marketing tactic by the industry. To, to get around to keep people the non-smoking. Smoking. That's right. Because you can smoke these where it's non-smoking. That's right. Because there is no secondhand smoke involved with them. Or the dissolvable products you can eat. Oh, so you would eat the nicotine. That's right. In the dissolvable And then it would go products. into your stomach. That's right. That's right. But does it go into your lungs as well, or it just goes into your stomach? It goes into your system, your whole system, and you know, stomach and then through your blood. Over yes, there. yes. And so you, your body um, absorbs the nicotine and the levels of tar that are in there in the in those products. Yeah. Uh, and just before we close again, could you give me your full name, title, and uh, the telephone number where somebody can get a hold of you, Tina? Thank you sure. so much. Sure. Sure. Again, I'm Tina Grisowski, the project coordinator for the Central Mass Tobacco Free Community Partnership. And my phone number is 508-856-5067. Thank you, Tina. Wonderful information. Thanks, Ramona. And good luck with your next celebration. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you'll be there. Oh, me too. Thank you very much. I am Ramona, and you've been watching Ramona Interviews. Have a wonderful week.